Isn't that a beautiful uh, time of the year? Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Just absolutely wonderful weather. And uh, we have a great privilege of gathering in freedom to worship our Savior as we choose. And I'm thankful for that. Continuing to speak about the life and times of Jesus Christ, and we're in Luke, excuse me, Matthew chapter 3, and we're in verse 13, so if you found that place, please stand with me, and we will uh, pray, and then we'll read the Word of God. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Word, the Bible. It speaks to us. Your word contains words of life and of hope in times that are very discouraging. But in Christ, we can do all things through him who strengthens us. And we thank you for sustaining us and lifting us up and showing us the way that we ought to go. Now I pray that we would hear and then do the things that we Learn from your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 3, and we're at verse 13. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and Jesus saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You may be seated. I'm going to need uh, help today up there, Zach, because I'm going to need you to advance the cell for me. So I'll, I'll just let you know. So if you would move it to the next slide, and then the next slide. There you go, that's good. First point I want to talk about today is right from the text. Everything's right out of the scripture today. The first thing is Jesus had already died to himself. You know, when Jesus Christ came to be baptized, the scripture says Jesus came from Galilee, actually Nazareth, in the Galilee region, to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And the next slide indicates to us that Jesus was very humble. You know, when Jesus Christ came to John the Baptist, John the Baptist looked up to him and he knew because John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus, John the Baptist knew this was Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the one that they were all looking for. And he who has no sin was coming to John the Baptist to be baptized. Now, we need to remind ourselves, the baptism was a baptism that people submitted themselves to do publicly after they repented of their sin. They were not being baptized in order to have their sin washed away. They were being baptized because they had put their faith in Jesus Christ, asked the Lord to forgive them from their, for their sin. The Lord forgave them and then they would be Baptized is a public demonstration that not of washing, but of being dead to self, dying to self, submitting themselves to the Lord Himself. So it was a picture of being buried in the water and then raised up, having died to self and then raised up to live a new life. And we say to live a new life in Christ. But for Jesus, what bothered John the Baptist is. Why are you being baptized? And we're going to talk about that. Why did Jesus be baptized? He had never committed any sin. He didn't need to repent of any sin either. So that's a question I ask baptism candidates all the time. 
Why was Jesus baptized? So Jesus was very humble. Philippians 2, 5 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, that's an instruction to us. It's like a command to us. We're supposed to take upon ourselves the mind of Jesus Christ. We're not supposed to think like we did before we were saved. When you die to self and you're buried with Christ in baptism and raised up to live a new life, you're not supposed to continue to think like and act like we did before. This is basic stuff. And it says, who being in the form of God didn't consider it robbery. What that means is Jesus was not hanging on to the glory of God. He was not hanging on to uh, being the Lord and sitting on a throne. He was, and I submit to you that in all of history, the most humble person ever to walk this earth is Jesus Christ. He was willing to cast off the appearance of his own glory and to humble himself to be born in a stable. This is the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one that created everything that exists. Humbled himself to be born in a stable. And it says, uh, he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And the next line says, being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself and he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. There's no one that's as humble as Jesus Christ. He should be the aspiration, the goal, the, 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 the one that we want to become like, our hero. The one that we would love and be grateful to forever. Jesus humbled himself and he died for you and for me. Next slide. Luke chapter 2 verse 7. Mary brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in the manger. Folks, that's a feeding trough because there was no room for them in the inn. The thing that's so puzzling to a lot of people is why would God choose to be born in a baby instead of just showing up on a white horse? He's going to do that later. Why didn't he come in all his glory and glowing robes? And why wasn't he demonstrating the, the glory of his, the Shekinah glory of his brilliance so that everyone would be just falling before him and worshiping him everywhere he went? Because he came to accomplish something that he had to do in order for you and me to be saved from our sin. He who knows no sin came to take our sin on himself and to die on an old rugged cross so that we could be forgiven of sin and receive the gift of forgiveness. You ever done anything wrong? And if you've done something wrong, did you ever think, you know, I wish I hadn't have done that. Sometimes you wish you hadn't have done that because you're in trouble with somebody else and you know they're going to come and get you. And that's one way. <laughs> Another way is you've done something that's wrong and you maybe hurt somebody who's always been good to you. That really hurts. And you realize you hurt someone who has never done anything to you and you've hurt them, disappointed them, made a promise, didn't keep the promise. And you've hurt somebody else and you realize, boy, mea culpa is the Latin word for that. I'm guilty. <laughs> I'm guilty. And you go and you say, you know, I need to be forgiven. If I could just be forgiven, if I could go back and not do that again, if I could go back and change that, if I could somehow be forgiven. And have you ever gone to someone and asked them to forgive you and they refuse? Now you've messed up and you've not only messed up, but now you've lost a friend. Hopefully it won't last long. Hopefully they'll get over it. Hopefully they'll forgive you and you can reconcile and be friends again. I have seen, over the years, I've seen families that do things to one another and hurt each other and they just can't forgive each other. And families break up. That's horrible. I've seen husbands and wives, they make vows in a chapel or a church somewhere and they, 
dedicate themselves to be faithful to one another forever and then someone does something they shouldn't have done and the other person just can't forgive them and the marriage is destroyed. Be sure your sin shall find you out. There's consequences when we do things we shouldn't have done. Sometimes it's just saying something. And it's a lie when people say, you know, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt me. That is a lie. Words hurt. Do you know how powerful words are? God created the whole world with words. He gifted us among all the creation, creatures on the face of the earth. Mankind has this ability to speak, to communicate thoughts and ideas and values and our emotions and so many things that we can communicate with one another and, and I'm thinking what a precious gift we have and yet we should be careful not to misuse the gift that God gave us. The tongue. <laughs> you know, you hear about these crazy people who go out and they start fires. Pyromaniacs, they start fires. Some people are pyromaniacs of another kind. They use their tongue to strike a fire where there was no fire and to assassinate the character of another human being, that's murder. And they don't even realize how awful it is to misuse this gift of the tongue sometimes. And we're talking about a little baby that humbled himself and was born. Next slide. So Jesus came to die for us. John 12, 27. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, Jesus is saying this, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Verse 32 continues, and I, if I'm lifted up, He's talking about being lifted up on the cross. From the earth I will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, in case we didn't get it, signifying by what death he would die. Jesus came to give his life, to die for people who had sinned against him. Is there anyone who loves us more than Jesus Christ? There is no way. He came and we, he'd never done any sin at all. And he took our sin on himself and took our punishment that we deserve. He took it in our place to save us from our sin because there's no way we could ever, not ever, have earned the forgiveness of God or have been perfect enough to say, Oh God, I'm such a good person. You ought to let me in heaven. <laughs> Next slide. Matthew 20, 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. You know that every other religion in the world is either a religion of works, or certainly it's a religion where the God or the many gods in some religions are, they're the ones that are angry, and they are the ones that have all the power, and they cause all the storms and the earthquakes and the troubles and... They're the ones that give you the good crops, and you go to these all these phony gods, and uh, I'll just say it like it is, they're all phony. And you know, you're supposed to go to this God and beg Him to be good, and what did Jesus do? He is God. He came in the flesh. And instead of demanding from us at that time, He took our sin and died for us. There is no other religion on this planet that has any theme like that. Next slide. And Jesus was committed to fulfill all righteousness. When John the Baptist <laughs> said that he he didn't, you know, I wasn't even he wasn't even fit to uh, tie the sandals of Jesus. He said uh, this way. He said, "I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me?" Because John the Baptist knew he was a sinner. Next slide. Jesus' answer to John represents the character of Jesus' mission. When he came to earth, he said, Let it be so now. I want to back up. That's it. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And that is a key thought. Do you all understand that? When he says... He needs to fulfill all righteousness. 
Jesus' baptism was a baptism of repentance. But you're saying, but Pastor Rick, he never committed any sin. I said, well, that's correct. But he fulfilled all righteousness, and it was a baptism of repentance. That's what John was doing. Well, why would Jesus submit himself to be baptized, a baptism of repentance? Because he was in the business of coming to take your sin and my sin upon himself. He was in the position of repenting for sin he hadn't done. He put himself in the place of repentance for our sin when he's never done any sin. There's no greater humility than this. For someone to take someone else's sin and to repent from sin that he hasn't done, there's no other religion, there's no other person, there's no other system like this that Jesus Christ would be so humble to do that for you and for me. He came to die for our sin. Matthew 20, 28 says, Just as the Son of Man didn't come to serve, but to serve, to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus lived his life to serve. If you read the Gospel of Mark, you'll see how many times it speaks about Jesus serving and meeting the needs of others. If you have never put your trust in Jesus Christ, I am begging you today to examine your heart and see the sin that's in your own heart. I'm begging you to consider the fact. It's a fact. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He has never committed any sin, nor will He ever. And He came to give His life for you. Personally, you. He gave His life for you. Because He wanted to save you and give you a whole new life. So when Jesus said He came to fulfill all righteousness, we need to understand how precious that is. When Jesus was willing to give His life for us, isn't that an example that calls us to offer ourselves to God in the same way that He offered Himself to us? Shouldn't our response to the Lord Jesus Christ be to say, Lord, I love you. Thank you for doing what I could never do for myself. I offer what I am, little that I am, but I offer all the little that I am to you and to serve Him in the same way that He died for us. Yet we have a problem, and our problem is self. Self. Sometimes it comes out as pride or arrogance. Sometimes it's angry because we get angry that someone else isn't doing what we want them to do. Or because someone else envy, we get someone else got something that we wanted and covetousness comes in and we want what they wanted and we're angry and upset and envious because they got something that we didn't get. Isn't that the way we are? We are something else. <laughs> and it's not always very good. Anyway, Jesus calls us to offer ourselves Selfish passion guides many lives around us. That's why there's so much trouble. If people weren't selfish and prideful, but instead thinking about others before themselves and humble, we would crime would go away. If people weren't thinking about what's in it for me, but were thinking about how I could bless somebody else, all the theft would stop. Murder would stop. It would change the world, but that's why Jesus came, because He knows we need a Savior. We're not able to do that by ourselves. And He reminds us that we have a higher purpose for our life. Jesus' righteousness doesn't just cover sins, it also covers our repentance. Jesus' righteousness does not just cover our sins, it covers our repentance. We can too easily think the Christian life of repentance and faithfulness is part of redemption that's up to us. If it depended upon us to be righteous, if it depended upon us to repent and remain repentant, we'd all be doomed. We need to get real. There is no way that I could ever say that I or any of us will ever be so good that God would say, well, I'm so glad you're never, ever, ever like you used to be. And you're always, all well, always just doing the right thing, the good thing, the godly thing. Never thinking about yourself. Always thinking about everybody else. Always trying to serve God. 
you know what? Here's our problem. We think that when we ask Jesus to be our Savior, from that point on, we never ever have any bad thoughts. Never say anything we shouldn't have said. Never do anything we shouldn't have done. And if we do, we think it all depends on me. That's why some churches think that you lose your salvation. Every time you have a bad thought or say a bad thing or do a bad thing, you just keep losing your salvation. And I'm getting saved again. I want to say, it never depended upon you and me, salvation. And it never will depend upon you and me uh, because God knows us. He knows us intimately. He knows our heart. Jesus' righteousness doesn't just cover our sins, it covers our repentance because it's not that we keep our own nose clean. God has to keep reaching down and cleaning our nose. <laughs> Jesus Christ fulfilled all righteousness. He fulfilled all Righteousness, not half, and the other half's ours. He fulfilled all righteousness. Every word is so important in the Bible. He fulfilled all righteousness, even the righteousness that should be present in our repentance. But unfortunately, tragically, it's not. Should that be the desire of our heart? Of course. You get born again, you want to live for Christ. You may put all the effort you have in your whole body into trying to live for Jesus. And then you mess up. Then you think, I wonder if I'm even a Christian. How could I even have said that? How could I have done that? If you believe on Jesus, your salvation is all dependent upon Him and what He did for you and me upon the cross. We do not deserve that. Isn't that the most precious gift? What Jesus Christ did for you and for me. If you put your hope and trust in Jesus Christ, you put it in the right place and the right person. Jesus had absolutely no need of repentance for forgiveness of sin. And he is the Lord. He's the Lord of righteousness. He's the Lord of grace. Not just righteousness or grace. He's the Lord of righteousness and grace. Look at Matthew 28. It says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me, to Jesus, in heaven and earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then the next slide says, teaching them to observe all things. That means to obey all things I've commanded you. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. That's what Jesus said. Next slide. Philippians 3.9. That we might be found in Him. Or I might be found in Him. You might be found in Him. Not having my own righteousness. You see, I'm not making this up. It's right in the scripture. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. The law just convicts me I'm guilty. But that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. I am telling you. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. If you have never put your faith and trust in Him, do it today. Come to the, come to the altar at the invitation today and... Ask God to forgive you of your sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Surrender your life to Him and He'll forgive you and save you and you'll never be the same again. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. Look at the second point. John the Baptist was aware of his own need. Even John the Baptist, a very good man. John tried to prevent him and he said, I need to be baptized by you. Are you coming to me? First point. John the Baptist needed forgiveness. Yes, he did. Romans 3.23, next point, says, All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. That even includes you, friend. This all means even you. We all need to be forgiven. We have all messed up somewhere along the line. Next, next scripture. Ephesians 1.7 says, In Jesus, in him, we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The next scripture says, the wages of sin is death. That's why death came upon the world. It's a consequence of sin. It's the curse upon the world. The horrible part about death isn't just that you cease to live as a physical body. The horrible part about death is separation. You ever have somebody that you love very much, 
and they died, and they're no longer with you. They're separate from you. That's what death does. It separates. And what sin does is it separates you from God. That's the wages of sin, that death, separation from God. Next point. John the Baptist assisted Jesus. He submitted to what Jesus said because Jesus said, Permit it to be so now, for thus it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John the Baptist allowed Jesus. In fact, he helped him. Next slide. When Jesus was baptized, he was identified as the Messiah. He is the Messiah. The Messiah means the anointed one. That's Jesus Christ is the anointed one. And I'll tell you how. That's the next point. The Holy Spirit came upon Jesus. When he'd been baptized, the scripture says, Jesus came up, and that's the next slide, immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Speaking about Jesus. So Jesus came up from the water. By the way, you can't come up from the water unless you were in the water. Some churches teach you take a little bit of water and you sprinkle people. That's not baptism. Some people teach you to take a little water and you pour it on people. That's not baptism. The Greek word baptizo means to immerse, submerge, or place beneath. It's talking about when you're dead, you get buried. You get buried. That's a picture of water baptism. It's not a picture of getting washed. I said it before. I'll say it again because people get so confused about this. Baptism is about dying to yourself spiritually, being buried, and then raised up in Christ because he died, didn't he? He was buried, wasn't he? And he arose again. Praise God for that. He arose again. Because Jesus died and was buried and rose again, when you receive him as your Savior, you spiritually are as if you also died to yourself and were buried and were raised again to live a whole new life. <laughs> I am so thankful for this. It says, And behold, the heavens were opened to him. That's really important. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and alighting upon him it was not a bird. This is the Holy Spirit of God, the person. Suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus saw the heavens open to him. This is so significant. Every word of this is so powerful. When the heavens were opened, this is because Jesus is the Son of God, because God was well pleased in him. It indicates Jesus had no sin, because God is never pleased with sin. If Jesus had had any sin in him, God would not have opened the heavens and said, I'm well pleased. He would have had to turn away from it, his Son, as he will do later when Jesus dying, is dying on the cross. And he had our sin on him. Because God cannot stand in the presence of sin. God is holy, holy, holy. He is without any sin. He doesn't allow it in his presence. So when, he's, when the heavens were opened, this is significant. God's getting ready to speak. He opens the heaven, which meant Jesus had access to to God the Father in heaven, you're going to love this. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you're born again, God forgives you of your sin. He adopts you into his family. That's how you become a child of God. You get adopted. God will never disinherit you if you're his child. Something else. This means you are now, if you're a believer, in Christ. If you're in Christ, the heavens were opened. Jesus had access to heaven. If you're in Christ, the heaven remains open to you if you're a believer. And you have access to heaven in Christ. Amen. This message today, it is so powerful. It is so liberating. It is such a message of great news. I don't even want to call it good news. It's the greatest news. We can have access to God. The heavens are open to us in Christ. We can talk with God. God hears us. God will answer us. We have access that when we come to the end of this physical life, 
That's not all there is. The best is yet to come. Because when we leave this life, heaven remains open to you and to me because we're in Christ. And we will leave this place and go to be in the presence of God in heaven forever. I hope I'm getting through with the message of hope. We don't have dead hope. We don't have a dead Savior. We have a living hope and a living Savior, and His name is Jesus. Amen. I'm so thankful I'm a preacher of the gospel. <laughs> I couldn't do this any other way. Let's look at this. Roman, Luke 3.21. This is how Luke says it. Watch it. When people were baptized, it came to pass. Jesus also was baptized while he prayed. The heaven was open. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit. Ah, different. More illumination. The Holy Spirit descended in bodily form. Like a dove. Not a bird. And a voice came. In other words, the Holy Spirit in bodily form came from heaven. If we could only have been there. I can't imagine how this is, but God the Father is in heaven. The Holy Spirit descends in bodily form and comes upon Jesus, in other words, gently, like a dove. He comes down out of heaven and comes upon Jesus, and we see the Father speaking. We hear Him speaking from heaven. We see the Holy Spirit of God descending to be on Jesus, and the Son is the one who's being anointed. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all present when Jesus is baptized. Amen. Whoa, what a day. What a witness. And a voice came from heaven which said, You, speaking to Jesus, are my beloved Son, and who? In you. He didn't just say, I'm well pleased. He said, In you I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began his ministry. He was about 30 years old. Wow. That's Paige. You want to know about the dove? There was another dove. Remember the ark? And when they were in the ark and they were out there just drifting along with all these stinky animals out there for months, weeks, months, days. No opens the door to the ark and he takes a dove and he sends a dove out and the dove comes back. He sends a dove out and the dove doesn't come back. That's a good sign that meant the land had dried up. You could open the door. He said, he sent, he sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. You see, the whole earth was under judgment of God, the wrath of God. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. You see, when the, when the Holy Spirit comes the next time, where does he come to rest? On Jesus. And she returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. Next slide. And he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And no one knew that waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return to him anymore. It's the same picture. When the Holy Spirit shows up, it's good news. It's good news when He brings an olive branch. Would that represent peace? That's what that represents, peace. i got to move on. There's so much more there. Next slide. God the Father identified Jesus as His beloved Son. The voice from heaven, that's the next point, is God's. It says a voice came from heaven, that's God the Father, when He said, you're my beloved Son. That was a public confirmation of the identity of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and it was the initiation of the public ministry of Jesus Christ. He was about 30 years old. I'm having trouble remembering when I was 30 years old. Tom's, Tom's 30 years old. Tom is the same age Jesus Christ was when he began his public ministry, and this is when... Tom received his first ministry assignment. Ooh, that's pretty neat. Good time. <laughs> Look at Isaiah 42. Verse 1 says, My servant whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I have put, this is Isaiah, this is the Old Testament. This was written 700 years before Jesus is baptized. 
I have put my spirit upon him. Does this sound like a prophecy? He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. That means me. I get saved because he's coming to save even me. Children need affirmation from parents. God the Father affirmed his son when he was beginning his public ministry. And I'm thinking, do you understand how important this was to Jesus? He's been born in the stable. He's been a little child. They had to run to Egypt. They came back from Egypt to this little town of Nazareth. He's been working in a carpenter shop. Jesus created the entire universe. He's been working in a carpenter shop in a little town of Nazareth, blowing sawdust out of his nostrils. That's how humble Jesus is. That's how much he loves us. And when he began his public ministry, God the Father spoke and he says, You're my beloved son. Do you think Jesus needed to hear a word from his father at this moment? He was going for the next three years to be con confronting people with sin and to be teaching repentance and he was going to be calling people to the gospel and explaining that he is the son of God and others just wouldn't reject, would reject him and the father says, you're my beloved son. How important is it that we affirm one another to do the work God called us to do more than you and I realize. Mm -hmm. How important is it for us to encourage one another? And even though we are all imperfect, if you're in Christ, how much sin do you still have to account for before God? If you're in Christ, how much sin do you still have to account for when you stand before God? None? You have to account for all of them. Will you have to stand the wrath of God for all your sin? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That's the good part. He's going to say, I remember your sin no more. We, can't, we have a hard time accepting this. Your sin will be separated as far you if you're in Christ as the east is from the west. They'll never meet. This is when we stand before God someday in Christ. Like Jesus, he can say, you are my beloved and accepted child. Amen. Enter in. That's not of us. That's all Jesus. That's all what God's done for us. Next point. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. I'm persuaded neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Read that over and over to yourself and realize nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Next point. God the Father said Jesus is without sin. He said, and you I'm well pleased. Psalm 2 verse 7, which was written a thousand years before, says, I will declare that I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, this is Jesus speaking. 